Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon for those of you who are in Europe and good evening for those who are joining us from Asia. So this is the second session of the Forum Earth Science and the New Map. Uh, so welcome to the second session. My name is Russell Sorkabi from the University of Utah. Before we start, I request all of you to mute your audio so that there is no sound interference during the presentation. So let me say a few words about this forum and then um, introduce our speaker today. As geoscientists, we all know how important earth science is for society, for supplying mineral and energy resources for the environment and so forth. However, geoscience is now facing many challenges ranging from education, employment, funding, to breakthrough discoveries, public relations, publish, policy issues, etc. Now, some of these challenges are obviously related to the 2020 pandemic, but others are specific to earth science. So we need to discuss these issues and challenges. We need to take a step back and look at all the progress we have made and share it with the public and policymakers. We also need to create new opportunities and new prospects for our research and for our community. And how best we can train the next generation of geoscientists. So this forum, Earth Science New Map, is a small attempt in this direction. And I hope that many other geoscientists and especially students also join this forum. Now, our speaker today, Dr. Mike Simmons, is Technology Fellow for Geoscience and Exploration at Halliburton in the UK. Mike has a PhD from the University of Plymouth in England. His career has spanned both industry and academia as he has worked for British Petroleum, Aberdeen and Cambridge Universities, for Neftex as Earth Model Director and um, recently at Halliburton. Dr. Simmons has conducted um, research on sequence stratigraphy and petroleum geology, especially of the Middle East and Tethian regions. He has published extensively both research papers and book volumes. Um, I should particularly mention his 2018 book, Great Geologist, published by Halliburton and distributed freely to students and geoscience community. In June 2020, this year, he also published uh, with uh, co-authors um, an article entitled, Who Needs Geoscientists in the GeoExpro magazine, which is available online. Dr. Simmons is a visiting professor at the University of London and a scientific associate of the Natural History of Museum in London. We will have, uh, time for Q&A after his presentation. So you may post your questions in the chat box or ask them directly later. Um, please brief in your question and comments to give sufficient time to other participants as well. Now, without further delay, I will hand this meeting and the screen over to Dr. Mike Simmons to deliver this presentation entitled Hydrocarbons, Geoscience and Energy Transition. I should mention also that his co-author for this presentation is Dr. Andrew Davis, also at Halliburton, UK. Mike. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully everyone can hear me well. Um, it's a great pleasure to give this talk this afternoon and I uh, congratulate Razul on organizing this forum. I think it's very important for us as geoscientists to become aware of the nature of the energy transition and the role that geoscience is going to play in that so that we can have informed debate with both our colleagues and the general public who are often less aware of the realities of the energy transition than uh, perhaps uh, we are as practitioners in the subject area. So yes, this is a, a presentation on the nature of the energy transition and how geoscience will uh, form a role in that. And I'd like to credit uh, Andy Davis, my co-author who helps me put these things together. Uh, very much it's a team effort and Andy's on the uh, call today. So hopefully you can see my slides. 
So first of all, a uh, quick legal disclaimer, um, just to say this presentation is really only for information purposes only, and uh, the views here are those of Andy and I, but not necessarily the views of Halliburton. So what we're going to, to cover in this presentation, uh, we're going to look at, first of all, who are geoscientists? I'm sure nearly everyone on the call is a geoscientist, so you might wonder why I'm going to start with that, but I think it's good just to reflect on what we we know and, and um, provide. And then we'll look at energy and society and the role that energy plays in modern society. And then how we're going to see that energy provision change over coming decades, the role that hydrocarbons will play in that change and how that will play out in terms of geoscience careers and the way in the types of activities that geoscientists will be involved in. And then at the end, a few words about geoscience research, directions that may take, particularly digital transformation with things like machine learning, assisted interpretation, automation, uh, AI coming into play. So that's the agenda for this afternoon uh, or the morning for you. Um, so let's get stuck into it. So first of all, a question about who are geoscientists? And here are uh, several different types of geoscientists. And we are a very diverse group of, uh, of scientists. We encompass a whole range of activity, as I'm sure most of you are aware, ranging from the very academic, perhaps, um, such as uh, looking at um, dinosaur paleobiology. There's a picture of a, a paleontologist at the top left there excavating a a sauropod femur in uh, some Jurassic deposits in Portugal. Uh, we often get involved in field work, um, the picture in the, the center there, but we're also based in labs and in offices where we use laboratory technology uh, and uh, computer software to effectively understand the history of the earth, the subsurface and the processes that, uh, that operate within the earth and on the earth. But it's true to say that many of us are also uh, in the practical application of geology. And geology has always been a practical science. The, you know, the science of geology came about for practical purposes. The very early geoscientists uh, were involved in, in mapping resources, uh, be that rocks for quarrying or coal, um, metal ores. Uh, so geologists have always had a practical um, aspect to their work and people work in mining or on the oil industry and I would say that probably about two-thirds of the geoscientists employed in the US are employed as practical industry geologists in one industry or another. Not all oil and gas but um, yeah it can be other industries as well. And as geoscientists all of us even though we're diverse and we cover a, a range of activities uh, we have some interesting sort of generic skills that we should be aware of and they apply whether we're working as geoscientists in the field or geoscientists in an office. So we have our core skills, be that sedimentology, biostratigraphy, geochemistry, structural geology, seismic interpretation. Those are our, if you like, domain skills. But we also have sort of more generic skills. And this is, these are going to be really important as we go into the energy transition because we're going to need very clever geoscience experts, but also who can tackle some of the problems I'm going to cover later in the presentation by using some of these skills that I've listed here. So we're great at problem solving and especially solving problems and thinking based on limited amounts of data. Geologists are used to trying, looking at an outcrop here, an outcrop there, a well section here, a well section there, and piecing together what's in between. And that sort of approach is predictive approach is always going to be useful as we try to um, continue providing energy resources for society as we go into the 20, continue going through the 21st century. We're great at data integration, pulling together different sciences. We're good at working with each other, sedimentologists working with stratigraphers, working with seismic experts. And we're very familiar with dealing with uncertainty and risk. So we, we don't bulk away from uh, as I say, limited data sets. Hopefully we're good at communicating all of this. And our key thing is that we're very good at visualizing the subsurface. One of the first things we learn as geologists is to 
create a geological map and then make a geological cross-section from that map, basically visualizing the subsurface from what's at surface. So those skills continue to be super important. Uh, and we should remember that whatever aspect of geoscience is, we have this skill set and we can transfer it to different aspects of our work as careers inevitably develop. Lastly, and I'll mention it at the end of the talk, data science is very important. Um, our ability to, to bring uh, some of the new uh, machine learning approaches, for example, to play on our data will be very powerful in creating insight. So geologists, uh, you know, we have a, a great uh, number of things to offer, but what's interesting at the moment is that there are uh, fewer geologists. Um, student numbers are in quite a steep decline, both in the UK and in a number of other Western countries, including the US. In the UK, we've seen student numbers enrolling for geology decline by about 35%. Uh, in the last few years, in the last five or six years. And I think it's a similar picture in, uh, in the US. And that's a concern because we need geoscientists. What this talk will show that geoscientists have a role to play and we need bright, thoughtful geoscientists who have all the skills on the slide I previously showed who can help with these problems. So we need to encourage people to come back to geology and to stay within geology. Yep, many industries are going through tough times at the moment, uh, that's understood. But, you know, as we'll see in this talk, the demand for resources isn't going anywhere. And, you know, we're going to need the brightest and best to help us with that. So now let's have a look at energy in society and start looking at the role that energy plays. Um, so we'll start off with the United Nations Sustainable Goals. Uh, there's 17 goals here that the United Nations promotes as being the basis for developing a global society going forward. And of course, all these goals are entirely laudable and no one would argue with any of these. What's interesting, though, is how energy relates to many of these. So energy is noted as sustainable goal number seven, affordable and clean energy. But energy in general enables many of the other goals to be achieved. It's very difficult to reduce poverty without energy in society to provide the infrastructure for industrial and agricultural development. Hunger requires um, infrastructure, and the abolishment of hunger rather, excuse me, the abolishment of hunger requires the creation of infrastructure, as does education and health, et cetera. So all of these key goals relate in some way to energy. Without energy, we'd struggle to, to, to meet these. And that can be seen, the role of energy can be seen in this graph here. So this is a recent graph produced by the International Energy Authority, which shows fluctuations in annual energy demand. And most of the years uh, up till uh, the present have shown a positive, they're above the 0%. So year on year, society is demanding more energy as society becomes more industrialized, more globalized, uh, more prosperous, more healthy, et cetera, we're demanding more energy. There have been fluctuations and the negatives uh, are often associated with uh, um, yeah, um, global catastrophes effectively. Uh, Spanish flu in the early part of the 20th century, the depression, wars, and more recently, the COVID pandemic. And the COVID pandemic has seen uh, the reduction in energy you can see at the end of the graph a 7% reduction in energy. I think what may be surprising to some of you is it's only 7%. Uh, you know, given that we're traveling less, we're having meetings like this online, uh, many people are not going to work, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The impression one would get is that we're using a lot less energy. But actually it's only a 7% decline, which I think shows how embedded energy use is in society. Whatever source of energy, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's renewables, whether it's nuclear, whether it's coal, whether it's hydro, that energy is vital to society. And the fact it's only reduced by 7% in the last year in this terrible pandemic, I think is a testament to how embedded energy is in all that we do. We can have a look at a couple more graphs about the, the importance of energy in society, just to bring that home. Quite a busy graph here, but it just makes a, a simple point about societal progress versus energy consumption. 
So on the bottom axis is energy consumption, and on the vertical axis is what's called social progress index. And essentially that's a measure of the degree of health in society, education, equality, um, et cetera. Um, and uh, basically there's a corollary between countries which have a high energy use and um, a high social progress. And you can see a number of countries at the top there which use a lot of energy and have what's by this measure a relatively high state of social progress. Perhaps another way, more simple way to think about this is to look at energy use versus life expectancy. And this is a graph produced from a data from a very useful organization called Gapminder, which uh, Andy and I would recommend you have a look at if uh, you're interested in this type of thing. Uh, and they produce, you can produce your own graphs from their data, uh, which help you understand um, the realities of uh, you know, modern society. And this graph again shows energy use, but here it's measured against life expectancy on the vertical axis. So each of the uh, bubbles you can see on there, the colored bubbles is a country. And um, the size of the bubble reflects the size of the country colored up by continent. And you can see I've picked out the UK at the top. Uh, so the UK uses about uh, the equivalent of 2,800 kilograms of oil per person per year. Um, and we have an average life expectancy of about 82 in the UK. Other countries in developing nations use a lot less uh, energy, uh, be it from oil and gas or be it from other energy sources. It doesn't matter, they use a lot less energy. And they have consequently appear to have uh, substantially reduced life expectancies. Of course, the graph does flatten out at the top and there is a, a, a point where the, the, the gain is, is, is minimal. But the key thing is, if energy is so important, then clearly, you know, isn't it right that all nations should expect to have the energy they need to progress and to improve things like life expectancy? So this leads us into a, a key concept called energy poverty. And Scott Tinker, uh, the former uh, president of the APG is very eloquent on this, and I recommend you look at his presentations online about this. And the, the issue is essentially this. Most countries in the world now have some access to electricity, and that's shown by the colours on the, uh, the, the map on the right. The, the darker the blue, uh, the greater the access to electricity. And there are very few countries with limited, almost zero access to electricity. But what does access to electricity actually mean? Well, for global organizations like the World Bank and the UN, access to electricity actually means quite a small amount of electricity, only 280 kilowatts per person per year which is the equivalent of energy of powering just a, a few light bulbs for a few hours, a fridge, a fan operating a few hours, a phone charger and a television. In developed nations, we have access to much more electricity. In Europe, about 6,000 kilowatts per person per year. Um, in the USA, nearly twice that. So there are a lot of people on the planet, perhaps as many as 4 billion people who have either no access, well, not so many, but uh, still a significant number, or have very limited access to electricity. So this energy poverty issue is, is real, and we need to find ways to ensure that people have the energy they need to live uh, the, the healthy and pros prosperous lives they wish to. So how is the, where is that energy going to come from? So let's have a look at that now. And obviously, uh, we're seeing the rise of renewables. And hopefully this, uh, this, this slide will animate, yes, it's beginning to animate. This is looking at how wind power has developed since 1984 to present. And as, as uh, this slide uh, animates, the green dots that are appearing are the presence of uh, wind power installations around the world. And you can see that uh, the wind power began in Europe and has spread out and uh, is now uh, developing in South America, in the US, in China, Japan, India but it's not global and it's not huge. Still, uh, wind power on a global scale uh, accounts for about um, five to six percent of total energy supply. So it's important and it's going to grow and it definitely will grow, uh, especially in places like Europe where there's a strong investment in making it happen. Um, but it's got a long way to travel yet and we should be aware of that. 
Um, so renewables are on the rise, but how easy are they to displace hydrocarbons and uh, coal for that matter, uh, fossil fuels in general? Because today, 85% uh, of the world's energy comes from fossil fuels. Yet in the future, we want to enjoy the same quality of life or even a better quality of life as a global society, uh, but we want to do it with zero carbon. So how challenging is that? So let's have a look at that. How, how easy it, is it going to be to achieve this vision? Well, renewables are going to rise, that's for sure. Renewables are going to form an ever increasing part of the energy mix. And uh, most projections, and I'm showing some from BP here, but I could show projections from the International Energy Authority. I could show UN projections. I could show investment house projections. They all say a similar story. Renewables are rising from a, a contribution at the moment of around about 15% in all the different forms of renewables, solar, wind, um, and in, renewables plus includes hydro. And that's gonna rise to about 30% um, in the next 20 years and become on a level par with the amount of energy provided by gas and oil and uh, coal will slip a little bit behind that. So 20 years hence, we'll have a very evenly mixed energy supply. And then over the next 10 years from that, we'll probably see renewables come up higher and supplying about 50% of uh, energy. But at the same time, total energy demand is increasing because the population of the world is increasing and we're going to see a lot more people on the planet and countries and individuals are going to continue to pursue prosperity. So that's going to push energy demand significantly up from its current levels of around about 14 billion tons of uh, energy equivalent to something like 18, 18 billion tons. So because of that, uh, actually no one energy source disappears off the map, even though they may be in decline. We'll see a, a plateauing of oil, perhaps, uh, a, a gentle rise in gas as a key transitional fuel, and even coal won't disappear from the picture. So we're going to see a, a mix. And why is that? So why, why do we not remove uh, coal, oil, and gas from the picture? And I'm particularly interested in talking about hydrocarbons. So how is it, how is it that it's so difficult? Well, the answer is that uh, the energy that provided by these sources is immense. And it's not so simple to, to replace that amount of energy. Consider this. So currently, fossil fuels, we use about uh, nearly 12,000 million tons of energy equivalent. And there are nearly that many days till 2050. So you'd have to replace a megaton of energy every day from now to 2050 to do that. And that's equivalent to introducing either one nuclear plant or 1,500 wind turbines every day to, to bring that energy down to zero. And that's not assuming the energy growth which we see on this graph. So the actual amount needed is much, much more. So that's really a, a statement of how different energy sources have energy efficiency. And we're not going to see uh, it so easy to, to displace uh, the various fossil fuels, not least oil and gas, because of their high energy efficiency. And that can be uh, summarized really as, uh, um, as what's called energy return on investment of energy. So what's the energy you gain from the actual cost, if you will, of the uh, obtaining that energy? So nuclear is the, the highest uh, ER OIE. Uh, the, the, the highest energy return on investment of energy, because although it takes some effort, not, not insignificant effort to locate and uh, mine uranium ore and process it, once you have it, very small amounts can generate huge amounts of energy. Hydro is also very efficient. The cost of setting up a hydro power station and the energy you get from it is very efficient. And then coal, oil and gas are actually pretty high EROIE. Other renewables have lower EROE because of the cost of setting them up and the amount of energy uh, a wind turbine, single wind turbine can provide or a, a solar panel or a solar cell can provide. So there are some challenges there. Another way of thinking about this is the actual, the value that's in a barrel of oil. So a barrel of oil has um, a huge amount of energy within it and costs relatively little. 
when I say a huge amount of energy, a barrel of oil contains the same amount of energy as a human working full time, eight days an hour, eight days a day, sorry, eight hours a day, five days a week for 10 years. So that's a huge amount of energy that a human would have to do to, to, to replace the amount of energy in a barrel of oil, if you will. So although a barrel of oil doesn't cost very much, relatively, uh, it's worth a huge amount if you put it in human terms. And that's basically a very cheap source of energy. And another factor here is displacing cheap energy. Cheap energy fuels global economies effectively. Let's take another look at some of the challenges that we have with um, bringing renewables into the picture. Uh, one is that uh, we've gone through energy transitions in the past and every energy transition brings in the need to, to utilize more and more different elements. And uh, renewable sources uh, require quite a broad source of uh, metals, for example, um, uh, and, and mineral sources to, to provide solar panels and wind turbines, for example. Now, what's challenging about these is the resource required. So um, a group in the UK, an academic group, not an industry pressure group, but an academic group had a look at this. Uh, because in the UK, we've stated that we want all of our um, uh, cars, uh, passenger cars, and small vans uh, to be electric by 2050 and, and, and stop sales of uh, non-electric vehicles by 2035. So uh, the energy, the, sorry, the, um, the uh, raw material resource to, to provide that just for the batteries within vehicles like the Tesla you can see uh, uh, on the right um, and the infrastructure of the recharging stations is huge. Um, that's two times the current annual production of cobalt, for example. Uh, uh, the current annual global production of neodymium is required to, for this transition. That's just for the UK. Imagine that we, we cycle that through every country in the world. The demand on these raw materials is very great. And that will act as a break uh, on the, in the, uh, the installation of renewable sources. Um, essentially, um, the demand on these resources uh, is going to require us to be uh, very uh, challenged in finding reserves uh, to meet those resources. And even uh, things that seem uh, very um, perhaps uh, unreliant on, uh, on scarce materials are still energy intensive to make transport install. This is uh, one of the new 90 meter long blades for a wind turbine made by General Electric. Uh, it's a plastic blade. Uh, that plastic of course is resourced from uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, but the whole manufacture of the blade and the, uh, the turbine station that it sits within uh, requires a lot of energy uh, and then to transport it and to install it. And then of course there is recycling issues with these things. So there's a lot of energy demand here as well, which is in a way you've got to put the renewables in, but you've also got to have the energy there to do that. So all of this translates into cost and uh, without laboring this point too, too, uh, too strongly, um, essentially the cost of uh, installing electricity sources, for example, that are wind or solar driven is significantly higher currently than uh, say gas fired power stations. Um, some of the figures uh, are shown on the, on the left there and say so in Denmark, for example, the price of electricity is nearly twice that in the UK, given that they have twice the, the wind solar capacity that we currently do. Now, people may be willing to pay those uh, higher prices, uh, but there is a knock on into the economy because it leads to higher uh, price of goods, etc. So I don't want to debate the ins and outs of the price and whether it's a good thing or not, but it's typically a break on transition. So what does that look like for future projections? And this is the key that I think uh, is the centerpiece of what I'm going to talk about this afternoon and this morning is what does that translate to into future demand for oil and gas? If there are these breaks because of cost, because of the infrastructure required, because of uh, the raw materials required, because of the, the energy density that uh, oil and gas can provide, what does the future look like? Well, here are some graphs produced by BP this year. Uh, and BP is, as you probably know, strongly pushing towards a, 
uh, net zero aims and uh, itself is transitioning to a more of an energy company than an oil and gas company, it's looked at some scenarios. So the white uh, line you can see is the rising amount of oil on the left and the rising amount of gas uh, consumption on the right. And then the yellow, green and red lines are as follows. So yellow is if we stopped uh, looking for oil and gas now and we just produce what we have. We have no more investment. We basically a declining supply curve. Red is a sort of business as usual scenario. I think it's quite an optimistic business as usual scenario, but that's assuming we don't push very hard at transitioning to renewables. The green line is a rapid transition towards renewables. It's attempting to meet the goals of the uh, Paris Agreement on climate change to reduce carbon emissions uh, significantly, install a lot of renewable capacity and limit temperature change to less than two degrees. So what does that translate to in demand? So the, the, the key message here is what is the area under the graph between now and the green line? And it's a lot. So currently, for example, we're using about 100 million barrels of day uh, of oil in the world. This rapid transition predicts that uh, by 2050, we'll still be using 50 million barrels a day. So it's half a reduction of half but the area under the graph is still a demand for 900 billion barrels of hydrocarbons. Or for gas, because gas is a, is a, a cleaner tr and, uh, transition fuel, the amount of gas demand is nearly 5,000 trillion cubic feet, which is a huge volume of gas. So it's effectively, the next 30 years, we're going to demand in a rapid energy transition scenario, 60% of all the hydrocarbons or the equivalent of 60% of the hydrocarbons that we've, uh, the, the oil that we've previously used, and 125% of all the gas we've previously used. So that's a huge amount of oil and gas that's going to have to be produced and then found because the supply and the demand uh, don't add up. So that if, we, if we stopped searching for oil and gas tomorrow and just let the supply curve drain down, we'd be left with a gap. It's the gray area which is equivalent to about 200 billion barrels or 2000 TCF of gas. So there's a huge amount of demand there. Effectively, we need to find another Saudi Arabia's worth of oil and we need to find another Russia's worth of gas to meet demand in a rapid energy transition scenario. Now you may say, well, this is BP graphs, even though they've, they're trying to show green credentials, perhaps uh, uh, it's, a, it's a, 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 a not a realistic scenario. Well, I could show lots and lots of graphs like this. This is Barclays Investment House. Uh, they predict that um, oil demand in 2050 will actually be more. They predict in a rapid transition scenario, what they call dynamism, about 70 million barrels a day. So that's more than BP's prediction. That would translate into over a trillion barrels of oil demand. So it looks like oil and gas are not going anywhere quickly. So what do we need to think about? That's, we can't just carry on though as, you know, as a business as usual looking for oil and gas. We're gonna to have to be smarter about it and do it in a different way to reduce the energy footprint and reduce the consequences of looking for that oil and gas. So what the focus of the industry is going to turn to, I think in the next 10, 20, 30 years, as we seek these hydrocarbons and seek to produce them, is we're going to have to focus on the carbon intensity of those uh, resources. Uh, we need to be efficient. And if you look at this map of the globe, you can see that different countries, their as a gross statement, their energy, their carbon intensity of producing hydrocarbons from them is, is quite variable. Um, Saudi Arabia has a relatively low carbon intensity, for example. That's because the fluids are quite light. Uh, quite pure, easy to bring to surface, relatively simple subsurface geology, high permeability and uh, good infrastructure and not requiring too much um, simulate, stimulate, I can't say it, uh, stimulation to get the hydrocarbons out the ground. Whereas somewhere like Venezuela, uh, very um, uh, um, viscous hydrocarbons, poor quality reservoirs, possibly poor quality infrastructure, all leading to a higher carbon intensity, effectively the carbon that's uh, produced as a result of producing and finding these hydrocarbons. So the industry is going to have to, to look and change its focus to seeking what's called advantaged hydrocarbons. 
What are advantaged hydrocarbons? These are hydrocarbons which have this lower carbon intensity to find and produce. So here's a map of the world and all the world's sedimentary basins and places where oil and gas is known today. I think that map is going to be reduced going forward. I think because we're trying to reduce the carbon intensity and companies are going to be judged by their ability to, to find these high advantaged hydrocarbons, um, it's going to change the map of uh, exploration and production, I think. So I think key things are going to be proximity to existing infrastructure, not having even to gather new data to find new resources. So really working with the data we've got, why shoot more seismic and expand energy in shooting seismic if you can uh, run the seismic vessels, et cetera, and then processing the seismic, if you can look at the data you've already got. Let's be clever about working with what we've got. That also applies to the reservoir models we build as well. You know, let's look at the fluids. Let's target reservoirs that are relatively easy to exploit, that have lower heterogeneity. We're going to look for high pressure uh, because that removes the uh, need for artificial lift and stimulation. Uh, we may want to inject CO2. We're going to utilize geothermal and wind energy at well site to reduce the energy footprint. There's lots of things that the industry is going to have to do, but this is going to require some very clever geoscience to get to. Uh, this is all really the search for these lower carbon intensity hydrocarbons is linked to superior subsurface understanding. And that's whether you're at the exploration scale and looking for clever ways to find these hydrocarbons around the world by building great paleogeographic models or detailed models of uh, depth structures within the subsurface, or better still, understanding reservoirs really well, uh, using outcrop analogs like this nice outcrop here in the southern UK to build a better reservoir model so that we can be more efficient, drill less wells, produce hydrocarbons with a lower carbon footprint effectively. Of course, that doesn't solve the problem uh, as much as needs to be solved. We still are, from the utilization of those hydrocarbons, bringing carbon into the atmosphere. So we're gonna to have to look to carbon capture and storage to change that picture. So carbon capture and storage, I think is the, uh, the, the big, uh, need of the uh, geoscience community to embrace and how our role in that is going to expand greatly. Um, given that we're dependent upon hydrocarbons for the foreseeable few next few decades, we have to do something with the carbon that's so produced. And that is a geoscience problem. So there've been carbon capture and uh, storage schemes uh, around the world. Um, you can see some on the, the top right. And the issue of carbon storage is, is very much a, a reservoir problem in reverse. Rather than extracting fluids from a, a reservoir, it's re-injecting fluids, be that into a depleted oil and gas field, uh, ideally a gas field probably, or into um, a saline aquifer, uh, where the, the uh, carbon dioxide can either be uh, stored as a fluid or react with minerals in that reservoir and precipitate out into a solid. Uh, essentially, it's a geological problem that we have knowledge about solving. We understand the subsurface. We understand how fluids behave in the subsurface. We can model them. Um, and we, I think you know, we are extremely well-placed to solve this issue. So geoscientists are increasingly going to be required to tackle the issue of carbon storage. It's going to range from screening. Where are we going to do this? Where are the depleted reservoirs or where are the saline aquifers? Uh, there's going to be an issue of public engagement around that uh, to, to assure people the process is safe. We need to understand how much we can inject and how fast we can inject it. We need to be assured that we can store it safely, that the top seals are as uh, uh, low permeability as they shouldn't need to be, uh, that there's no fault leakage, etc. We're going to have to look at the total capacity and then the containment of it. So we're going to see projects for carbon storage ranging from screening all the way through to trialing injection through to full phase projects. And we're going to need a lot of this around the world because currently we currently uh, store less than 1% of the anthropogenically produced CO2 uh, that goes into the atmosphere. So we've got a huge challenge to develop this. 
those same things apply to other aspects of renewables. Um, hydrogen is going to be a fuel of the future, a um, number of ways in which we can produce hydrogen. We have to store that hydrogen for future use, so hydrogen storage in the subsurface is pretty much a, a similar um, issue uh, to uh, carbon storage, you know, carbon dioxide storage, understanding the subsurface, understanding the injectivity of hydrogen and its residence time in the subsurface, etc. Another renewable uh, area where we can make a contribution is in geothermal. Uh, again, geothermal is all about understanding the subsurface. It's understanding uh, where are the aquifers, uh, permeable aquifers that are, either can produce hot water for uh, city and town heating, or where we can inject water heated through natural geothermal uh, heat sources and then returning to the surface superheated to ge generate uh, power through steam. So that requires ge geoscience knowledge of how the subsurface behaves and uh, things like geothermal gradient, for example. Another aspect of renewables that uh, in impact upon geoscience is, is wind farms. Uh, wind farms are, after all, just a form of engineering and we're very well practiced as geoscientists in engineering. So a little example here from the North Sea in the UK, offshore UK, wind farms like to be placed uh, by the wind farm engineers in uh, evenly spaced rows uh, for optimal uh, um, uh, energy production from the available wind. But unfortunately, often the bedrock uh, in the subsurface isn't evenly displaced. And in the North Sea, we have a, a strong um, shallow subsurface geology that's controlled by the, uh, the last glaciation events. And we'll have things like mud-filled subglacial uh, channels, which would make a poorer foundation for a wind turbine than, say, a, a, a more solid bedrock. So the reason I'm mentioning all of these things is although oil and gas is a big part of the picture, renewables are going to grow. And I think we're going to see geoscientists transitioning their roles. Some are going to stay within oil and gas and some are going to move over to looking for the raw materials to support renewables. Some are going to get involved in geothermal and uh, CCS and some are going to get involved in um, yeah, wind farm engineering. So it's a variety of tasks for the geoscientists, a huge variety of tasks. So let me conclude um, by talking a little bit about the research that's required. And, uh, you know, there's some exciting geoscience research going on at the moment. It's been a while since we had a big paradigm shift in geology. Plate tectonics was really probably the last big paradigm shift. But we are doing some exciting geoscience researchers in industry and in academia. And things include paleoclimate modeling, like the spinning globe you can see on the right. That's a paleoclimate simulation of temperature for the Maastrichtian and the Lake Cretaceous. And we use information like that to feed into uh, what's called source to sink and earth system science models, where we're starting to model the transportation of sediment from where it's eroded through its transportation system out into its ultimate sink where it's deposited. And that's interesting from a process uh, geoscience point of view because it integrates things like climate with tectonics, uh, used to see, substance, etc. But it's also very predictive and we'll need this kind of knowledge to help us meet these energy resource challenges. And also obviously things like climate modeling uh, also speak to modeling future climate change as well. So geoscientists, you know, know geological history, they know the impact of climate change and they're therefore well placed to understand climate change for the future. So multiple benefits to this type of research. The other type of research that I think is really important is digital transformation. Um, we see increasingly uh, data science coming to bear and really data science is the overlap of uh, maths and stats. Traditional integrated in a traditional way with domain expertise and then bringing in coding skills from things like Python and Jupyter Notebooks, etc. And in the industry, this is really a big thing. You know, now we interpret seismic data and well logs using um, train data sets to train machines to make interpretations of lithology or faults or whatever. And we can expect this to progress and develop even greater insights. And this speeds up the process of interpretation, freeing up the geoscientist uh, to make more uh, in, insightful, higher value interpretations. 
But also the machine learning itself will spot things that we as humans can't always spot. So there's a big trans transformation, I think, in the way that we take geoscience data and work with it. And that's important because we've got some huge challenges to find the hydrocarbons that we need to sequestrate the carbon that's produced and work within the whole sector of, of, of growing renewables and the, the energy challenges and the geoscience challenges associated with those. So that's the, the story. Um, I hope that's proved interesting. Geoscientists have a crucial role to play in the energy transition. Uh, we're involved from traditional energy sources through to the renewables. Energy demand isn't going anywhere uh, due to um, societal development and population growth. And different sources of energy having different efficiencies and effectively different costs means that the transition to renewables will be perhaps not as rapid as we might en envisage. And we'll see hydrocarbons as a, a part of the, the mix for the next coming few decades. We've got to be smart about finding those hydrocarbons. We've got to look for those advantaged hydrocarbons we mentioned earlier, and we've got to augment that by carbon storage. All energy sources will require some sort of energy know-how, as geoscience now, excuse me, and that's sort of supported by the need for these types of uh, geoscience research that I just mentioned. So a very important role that geoscience has in society going forward and I think as geoscientists we need to communicate that message to the broad public. A uh, little bit of reading recommendation at the end of this. Uh, Vaclav Smil is a, a, a Canadian engineer and physicist actually and he's probably one of the uh, unbiased gurus about the world of energy and he's just had a book come out called Numbers Don't Lie, 71 Things You Need to Know About the World. It's a very easy read book. It's one of those books with, you know, a, a key point per small chapter of two or three pages and then another key point to another chapter. And it, it, it's very informative about the energy transition. I recommend you take a look at that. Um, I've got a list here of um, many of the references we use. Um, Razul was kind enough to mention uh, the paper that Andy and I put together with... Uh, Andy Hill and Mike Stevenson on Who Needs Geoscientists, that's in GeoExpro. Uh, so you're welcome to look at that. And we have some other papers coming out, I hope, uh, towards the end of the year, the beginning of next year. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'll happily uh, take any questions you've got.